So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us um, to hear about some new results from JET. Uh, before we get going, I'll first introduce the, uh, the fellow members of the panel with me. So my name is Ian Chapman. I'm the Chief Exec of the UK Atomic Energy Authority. Furthest to my right is Mikhail Maslov, who was one of the scientific coordinators uh, for the high power experiments in the latest um, JET Express JET campaign. Then uh, immediately to my right is Joel Mayu, who is the head of the Jet Science Program Support Office. Uh, to my left is Ambrosio Fazzoli, who's the program manager, effectively the CEO uh, in charge of Eurofusion. And then further to my left is Atina Kapatu, who is uh, formerly one of the deputy task force leaders for the scientific campaigns at Jet. Um, online, we're also joined by Tim Luce, who is the deputy head of e the ETA Construction Project. Um, just before we get going with the presentation, I'll just say that you can feel free to put questions into the Q&A box at any point during proceedings, and we will come to them after a short presentation. Um, please do, when you put in your question, please do state your name and the media outlet that you're working with, and then we'll come to them in due course. So we'll start with two short presentations, firstly by Ambrosio and then by Tim. So I hand over to Ambrosio. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, and good afternoon from myself to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're here to discuss a significant advancement in fusion energy research made by the JET Joint European Tours last October. We appreciate your interest in our efforts to move towards a sustainable future powered by clean, near limitless energy. And we look forward to sharing our findings and engaging in open dialogue with you about the potential impacts and challenges ahead. Eurofusion stands at the forefront of fusion energy research and development. It unites many countries, laboratories, and a large network of researchers and engineers across Europe who collaborated to design the groundbreaking experiments we conducted last year on JET. These uh, scientific results are instrumental, paving the way for future projects, including ITER, the demonstration power plant demo, the UK step prototype power plant, and inspiring the worldwide efforts, private and public, towards fusion energy. JET is our flagship facility and has been the beating heart of European, European fusion research for over four decades. It's a place where our collective expertise converged to conduct some of the most advanced fusion experiments in the world. The highlight of JET's capabilities is the use of tritium. Its plasmas are made of a deuterium-tritium fuel mix. Over the decades, JET has evolved to be as close as possible to the performance, the systems, and materials anticipated in ITER, demo, and future fusion devices. Building upon our 2021 efforts, the final experimental campaign in late 2023 marked a historical milestone. The highlight came on October 3rd, 2023, when JET achieved a monumental result using a mere 0.2 milligrams of deuterium and tritium, the weight of a fruit fly, to unleash 69 megajoules of energy. This unprecedented feat broke our own previous record on JET, setting a new global benchmark in fusion research. And I'll let you now see this little star that we trapped in JET and hear its sound for a few seconds. Jet's journey underscore the crucial integration of many conditions to create and sustain fusion reactions. Our latest experiments demonstrate an evolving mastery, showing the world that we have achieved consistent, continued, and controlled fusion on Earth. This is crucial for each ambitions to achieve a tenfold power gain, moving us closer to fusion as a viable energy source. Our final DT campaign was in fact not set out to break records. Our goal was indeed to broaden and refine our understanding and control capabilities in the most important areas of fusion research. From the plasma core, which has to be maintained in steady state, to the plasma edge, the dynamics of which 
must be tamed, managing the harsh heat coming out of the plasma while guaranteeing the compatibility between the plasma itself and the surrounding materials. The many insights gained over these experiments are crucial for ITER's success, ensuring benefits from our comprehensive grasp of deuterium tritium plasma operations. These accomplishments at JET are a testament to more than just technology and science. They reflect the incredible dedication, resilience, and cohesion of our very large and diverse teams. The path to these discoveries was paved with countless challenges, each overcome by the thousands of individuals who contribute to JET. These successes constitute a triumph over the human spirit and a proof that we have almost no limits. We will all work together towards a common goal and in peace. JET's legacy will continue to influence future fusion research. Its final DT campaign and its new fusion energy record instill in all of us great confidence in the development of fusion energy. Beyond the groundbreaking results, the analysis of the plethora of JET data accumulated over many measurement campaigns will be a rich source of crucial information for many years ahead. As a final service to the community, JET's decommissioning enters a new era for science and offers unique insights into the management of the life cycle of fusion facilities, an essential element for the future fusion economy. This phase will not only yield lessons in sustainability and efficiency, but also guide future designs and engineering developments. JET's enduring contributions position it as a key influencer in sustainable energy evolution supporting ITER's progress and the broader fusion agenda. JET's pioneering endeavors and collaborative ethos will never cease to inspire the global fusion community, propelling us towards a future powered by clean, near unlimited fusion energy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambrosio. So we'll now hand to uh, Tim Luce, who will give us a few remarks about what these results mean for ITER. Uh, thank you, Ian. Uh, as Ambrosio very clearly emphasized, uh, the EDER project rests on the foundation of the world's community of science and technology research, and especially on JET, because JET is at the cutting edge. It has unique capabilities, and it has performed, as was said, uh, unique experiments. Uh, this first, let me say congratulations to the JET team on this result. Uh, it is uh, inspiring to us. It's uh, one of the key operating scenarios we intend to explore on ITER. And so having this result provides us confidence going forward. Uh, let me preempt one of the questions which inevitably will come up. Uh, what, what specifically was this uh, influence the ITER project or the ITER research plan? Uh, it's too fresh to say exactly what this specific result will do, but I have high confidence that it will have a large impact, and I can say why. The, uh, in the two years that we've worked, uh, that JET has worked since we last convened for the DTE2 results that were shown, uh, JET has performed unique experiments, once in helium, which they were uniquely capable to do, but also proving one of the key protection systems for ITER. And we're moving forward. And for the first result, we've changed the research plan uh, priorities based on the JET results. For the latest, uh, the protection experiments, we have, uh, we're ready to move confidently next month to a final design review on that. So while this result is fresh and exciting, uh, for us, what we look forward to are the details of how it was obtained because that's exactly what we need from the fusion community to move forward confidently with the EATER research plan. So I'm, I'm extremely confident that the results here, as they're becoming known and analyzed, will have a profound effect on the EATER research plan. Super, thank you very much, Tim. Right, uh, we will now turn to answering some of your questions. So um, I will bring in my colleague Celestine, who already has a number of questions in writing from you in advance. So we'll go through some of them and then start answering some that have been put into the Q&A live. Celestine. Uh, hi there. Uh, yes, I'm Celestine Chong, I'm the head of external communications and I'll be helping to moderate the session. So if there's any European media present online, you'd be pleased to know that answers can also be uh, delivered in French, Italian and Greek as well. 
uh, not only in English, um, just so that you're aware the session is recorded and we will put the um, recording on YouTube channels after. Um, so to start, and we did have a question from freelancer Doreen Schenk. Uh, what is the difference between the record achieved and announced in 2022 and this one that has just been broken? So I'll direct that to Athena. Yeah, I can provide a little bit of context. I think Tim already introduced this since the last time we had uh, the major deuterium tritium campaign. We went on a series of experiments uh, in helium for a stem set, but also in deuterium and where we studied a variety of uh, so-called plasma scenarios. These are ways how we can uh, structure and let the plasma run uh, in a way that it behaves how we want it and how we, want it, we wanted it to do. Um, and then that led into the uh, last uh, deuterium tritium campaign at JET, which had goals exactly addressing um, various aspects and challenges that we are looking ahead in ITER, but also a future uh, fusion power plant. And only one uh, of these experiments um, uh, was this uh, groundbreaking uh, record, um, which uh, I think has uh, glimpsed one of the questions is the uh, largest fusion energy um, uh, update ever. Uh, overall from fusion, uh, not just for jet, uh, but for the specifics of the uh, pulse that reached this very high fusion energy output, I, I would like Mikhail to tell us a few words as he was leading uh, these experiments. Thank you, Athena. Um, so the biggest difference was uh, strangely at the time. Um, so this experiment, this particular experiment was produced in DT2 in a very quick succession of pulses. So we had very limited time frame to do that. <clears throat> and we, we're doing something you're doing for the first time. So we only had a plan which we thought will work, but throughout the experiment, we didn't have a chance to adjust it. Then two years later, we had, uh, we had time to relax, look back and think very carefully, what can we do better? And we came with a, with a strategy, let's say, which would uh, give us uh, the highest chance of a better outcome and we were successful. We optimized uh, a very short uh, optimized seating method. So we, um, um, did, uh, we improved coupling of uh, so-called land cyclotron heating power. Um, we worked in collaboration with a brilliant team of engineers and scientists on the system. So very aware of it experiment at once and they were able to push the power a bit more. And that improved the stationarity of the pulse, which uh, ended up in the higher average energy produced. Thank you. Second question from Matthew Sparks uh, from New Scientist. How much further will ITER be able to push at these records? And I believe that question would be for Tim Luce. Okay, thank you. So uh, you can see the power levels were on the order of 10 megawatts of fusion power. The uh, project specification for ITER is to go to 500 megawatts with an option to go up to 700 megawatts. So these are um, what I usually call at the power plant scale. They're, they're at the lower end of what you would need for an, inter, uh, an electricity generating facility. Uh, in addition, we need to extend the time scale uh, to at least 300 seconds for the high fusion power and gain, but uh, perhaps as long as an hour uh, in terms of energy production. So it's exactly um, what JET has done is exactly a scale model of what we have to do in the ITER project is take uh, early transient results and then extend them uh, to as long as the machine can run, basically, or as long as we desire it to run, uh, which is exactly the, the lessons learned that we need to obtain from the, the JET experience here. They've done what we intend to do at the proper scale level, and we will explore the new physics, mainly the self-heating of the plasma through the products of the fusion reaction itself. That's the unique feature that we'll address in ITER. Right, thank you. Third question. So this is from the BBC's Jonathan Amos. Now that's a, a bit more of a political question. So how will the UK work with Eurofusion going forward and what, and will the UK try to make some sort of connection with ITER? Yeah. yeah, Jonathan, I can take that. So um, we formally, we have not been uh, members of the Eurofusion Consortium for a bit over three years now. Um, however, we've continued to work uh, essentially as we always have done. We have a shared history. We've worked together for many, many decades now. Um, we are embedded in one another's programs and we are clearly much stronger together. And so on, on the back of that, um, 
even though the UK has now decided not to be part of the Euratom Research and Training Programme, um, our collaboration with Eurofusion remains intact. Um, we continue to work together on a whole load of, of programmes, including, of course, these JET results that, 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 you've, um, that you've seen today. So um, we've both recognised that we are much stronger together and we continue to work collaboratively and intertwined just as we always have them. Ambrosio, do you want to comment from your side? I, I, of course, I can only confirm that we are extremely keen to find uh, to find common uh, elements of history interest. There are many, as Jan said, there's a common history, and I think the history we together will continue. Also showing the fusion um, in Europe, but also worldwide, uh, it uh, needs cohesion and is stronger putting uh, people, entities, and even countries together than any other political uh, difficulties. There are many, many unique uh, um, niches of, of competence in, in UK that uh, cannot be uh, maintained, isolated, and, and vice versa from, from the other countries in Eurofusion uh, towards UK. So uh, I really look forward to working together for many decades to come, and there's no higher tools in our collaboration in the future. I'll take one more question before we actually go on to the first question um, online, which is by Jeffrey Carr from The Economist. So one more question here, which is from um, the Daily Mail's Chris Pollard. So what happens to JET now uh, in terms of how is it going to be repurposed and decommissioned? I can leave that over to uh, Joelle. Uh, yes, yeah, so this year we're embarking on a, a long programme of decommissioning JET, and we're also uh, keen to reuse components where this is practical and useful. Uh, there's actually already a, a list agreed of um, uh, uh, sorry, measuring instruments uh, that we'll be heading for different laboratories uh, in several places uh, in Europe. They will be installed on other tokamaks existing and uh, in preparation. Uh, but there are also um, components, auxiliary systems that can be reused for other type of experiments. For example, the power supply, this is still under investigation. Uh, and uh, so we are, we are still building the plan for repurposing tech. Thanks. Right, next question. That's, I'll repeat that up. So on the screen from Jeffrey Carr of The Economist, is 69 megajoules the largest any energy output of any tokamak of ever, or is it just jet? And is the 0.2 milligrams of fuel the amount injected into the torus or the amount converted into helium? That'd be... <laughs> yes, I said before, this is a 90, 69 megajoules um, is the largest fusion energy um, ever achieved as a world record uh, as it stands. Um, for the details of the fuel, maybe Mikhail can comment, but indeed the 0.2 milligrams of fuel are the ones um, injected. Uh, 0 0.2 milligrams is the one which produced energy, it's the one which fused actually. Only a small fraction of uh, plasma fuels actually engaged in the, in the reaction. So we injected about one gram of tritium. Which of course had to be entirely and then uh, pumped out and purified and then restored. Okay, so this kind of follows on from a question from Dennis uh, Delbeck from the Talk Daily News of Switzerland. So that pertains to uh, what was the energy injected into the plasma to produce the 69 megajoules? Well, it's um, <clears throat> in the fact that we call capital Q, basically efficiency of energy production, which is around 30% or 0 0.30. 3 0 0.35 in the most recent experiment. So we injected uh, three times more energy, roughly speaking, than we produced. So this is not a break even as we call it. Right, Tom Whipple from the Times asks, what is the legacy of JET? And how do you feel now its life is coming to an end? Hmm. Like that, that, Ian? Yeah, I'll have a go. Um, Tom, personally, I think the, uh, the legacy of JET is the people, um, you know, Almost well, certainly all six of us that have been on the panel have uh, worked hard at JET and learned a huge amount from working hard at JET. So many of the people at ETA have been involved in JET, including the new director general at ETA. Um, so many, many of the high quality people that exist in Fusion have cut their teeth and learned lessons on JET. And um, and that, I think, is the biggest legacy, is the, the brilliant scientists and engineers which have been developed from using the JET, JET machine and JET program over many years who will go on to support ITER and indeed many other endeavours in fusion. And without that training, we wouldn't be as rich as a community as we are now. We wouldn't know as much as we do. So that, that I think, is our main legacy. Ambrosia, would you like to add to that? 
I, I think uh, I, I would like to add that jet is not over. The operations are over, uh, but uh, as even uh, Tim mentioned before, uh, there's a lot of analysis and a lot of physics, a lot of science, and also a lot of lessons learned on engineering aspects that will uh, continue to uh, be drawn from JET. So in that sense, uh, I wouldn't like to call the end of JET, but it's the end of operations of JET only. Yes, another question from, um, and please excuse if I get your name, uh, well, pronounce your name incorrectly, Robert Gass, site online from Germany. When will ITER begin operations? And when will it begin operations with deuterium tritium? That's for you, Tim. Yeah, difficult question to answer publicly at the moment because we're in the midst of updating our baseline. And uh, until we've uh, formally informed the members, it, it would be inconvenient for me to inform the public and the press about that. So let me just say that uh, we uh, intend, especially for the fusion power operation, uh, to uh, begin that uh, again in the next decade as we had planned in our original research plan. So uh, we, we've encountered some delays, but that end, the beginning of the, the end goal, which is to operate with the fusion fuel as JET has done here now, uh, should happen in the second half of the next decade as planned. Another question from German radio station. Um, this is from Frank. Uh, apologies again, if you get your name pronounced incorrectly, Growth Solution. So could you give me some details about the protection system for ITER tested by JET? That's to you again, Tim. Okay, so because the plasma has a lot of energy in it, uh, not just the fusion energy that's put out, but the energy contained that uh, makes the conditions suitable for fusion, uh, there are ways, uh, if there is some event that we uh, wanted to avoid, like a power supply failure or a problem uh, with some of the first wall components, you can release that energy very promptly. And uh, it's much, we're building something that's uh, the equivalent of an airbag, basically. Uh, we need to protect the machine against an accident. So it isn't intended to be used in routine operation, but it's there just in case, just like the airbag in your car. And uh, JET has provided, I would say, an unprecedented amount of uh, support through experimental runtime uh, in this last campaign to prove the design solution that we have for doing this in ITER. Uh, and as both the largest experiment uh, in terms of physical size, but also in the plasma parameters that can be run, it represents a unique uh, point in extrapolating the, the data that we have from most of the present experiments through JET toward ITER. So it gives the success that was done and the physics that's learned from the, ITER ex from the JET experiments that give us a high confidence, the confidence that this solution will work in the ITER context. Thank you. All right, we'll go back to uh, another political question. This is Esme Starlad from the BBC. With the UK still part of Eurofusion, but not Euratom, how much access will it have to ITER in the future? And how will its relationship work with EU partners? Yeah, OK, I can take that. Esme, uh, just to I mean, f be completely factually correct, the UK is not part of Eurofusion. We are associated partners to Eurofusion. So we still work with Eurofusion, but we're not full members, as it were. Um, regarding ITER, um, the UK government in October announced um, after we decided, after the UK government decided not to be a part of the Euratom Research and Training Programme, um, announced uh, an alternative programme called Fusion Futures. So you can find out information on the government websites about that. But a big part of that programme, and it explicitly says in the press release and the ministerial statement that accompanied it, was that the UK is um, very supportive of ITER and wants to find a way to continue to contribute to ITER and is happy to provide self-funding in order to do that and make contributions to the project. Um, we would contend that we have really very pertinent experience having operated a very large DT tokamak, which no nobody else has done, um, as well as you know running a tritium plant and remotely maintaining the, the device with robots. And those are experiences that are not found anywhere else in the fusion community. So um, we, we very much support ITER. We very much want to be part of ITER and we are in dialogue 
with our, our, our European and actually global partners on ETA to try to find a way to make that happen. But there is today no agreement on that, but it's something we are very much discussing. Right, then on that on that note, um, question from Hugo Seneca from um, Portuguese Espresso newspaper. So how will the UK, um, or will the UK invest in a new fusion tokamak? Sure, so um, as well as operating jet, um, within the public sector in the UK, we also operate a spherical tokamak compact machine called Mast Upgrade. Uh, and then there are other fusion facilities funded in the private sector too, that I should point out. Um, but the, the government also has a plan to build a prototype um, power plant called STEP, which is, stands for the Spherical Tokamak for Energy Production. Um, so it's a more compact design than, than uh, the ITER or, or indeed JET approach, um, aiming to produce net energy. Um, that is in the concept design phase at the moment. So we are in concept design phase. We hope to move into a detailed engineering design phase um, during this year. Um, and it will be a you know a multi-decade program to deliver that, but the government, the UK government, is very much in support of that. Right. Um, I'm not sure who Nicholas Vafiadis represents, um, but the question that Joe Pinkston from the Telegraph uh, comes across is quite similar. How much of a step forward are these results, and the improvement to the process for step? You mentioned step. Will these jet results help the UK launch a prototype commercial fusion power plant? And is it a boost to magnetic confinement over inertial confinement? Do you want me to have a go at that as well? Um, so uh, in terms of the importance of step, as I, as I said at the start, I think these jet results are important for all approaches to fusion, be that tokamaks, spherical tokamaks, stellarators, or even inertial confinement. We learn so much more about the handling of a hot fuel of a plasma um, at high operating conditions with deuterium and tritium fuel that we um, we didn't know previously, and so that there's real knowledge here that applies to all of those all of those machines, not just in the science, but also in the engineering and how you control it and how you operate machines like that. So in that regard, these results are super important, not just for ETA, but for for all other um, future power plants. Um, in terms of the, the boost for magnetic confinement over inertial confinement, I, I sort of reiterate what I just said. I think they're important for fusion, um, any approach to fusion, just like the results which came out of the National Ignition Facility a couple of years ago were important for fusion, not just inertial confinement. Um, they take us to parameter space that we've never been before, and we learn a huge amount of the physics that's happening in the fuel um, when we're in those conditions. So it's a boost for fusion, not just magnetic confinement fusion. Okay, actually, so it turns out Nicholas Vafiadis, he is from uh, Antenna TV Greece. So you might, if you might want to answer in Greek, you, you're more than welcome to. Um, so the question is, um, what is the next step after the JET experience on the experimental level and on a large scale? And Boris, it looks like you want to... I can do that, but not in Greek. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, first of all, you're, uh, I say uh, from the European perspective, obviously, uh, longer term, the next jet, the next step up to jet is, is ITER. Uh, and that would be the crucial step to demonstrate that we can uh, sustain a plasma that hits itself. And that's what we call a burning uh, plasma. And the fusion gain needs to be larger than five or uh, 10. So 10 times more power out than we put in the plasma. That, of course, is the ultimate demonstration that we can uh, construct a, a power plant uh, on Earth. Um, but before we get to ITER, we also have uh, a number of experiments that are going to be crucial in preparing the operation of ITER. And uh, in a sense, uh, coincidentally, uh, pretty much the same weeks that JET was running its uh, last experiments, there was the inauguration of the uh, JT60 Super Break Tokamak, which is in Japan, but is a result of a collaboration between Japan and uh, Europe. And we actually even symbolically passed the, uh, the certificate of being the largest operational tokamak in the world from JET to JT60, super upgrade. And uh, when I say we, I say, I, I mean the, the Eurofusion and all the European uh, partners. This is a machine that's uh, jet size, more powerful, in a sense, more modern because it has superconducting coils like, uh, like ITER and uh, uh, strives to demonstrate long pulse operation which is also very important for ITER, with a heating uh, mix, so the way we heat the plasma, that will be 
um, uh, relevant for, for, for power plants. And that's one key experiment in the future of the, of the size of jet um, that's coming online right now. Uh, and we shouldn't forget, we have a number of uh, also uh, very important experiments across Europe. Uh, we call them medium-sized uh, tokamaks in Germany, France, Switzerland, and of course, uh, UK. And a couple who are, uh, which are under construction in, uh, in Italy, DTT, and in the Czech Republic, Compass and Grade, that are very important to demonstrating some of the elements, some of the building blocks we need to understand and master and control uh, to optimize the ether operation and to minimize the risk in ether operation in view of not only making ether function as much as, as, as optimal, optimal as we can, but also in view of learning all the lessons we need to learn from ether. Uh, through all of these steps and uh, move uh, towards a demonstration power plant after it. Great, okay. Um, I won't um, pose a question to Ian just yet because maybe you have another bit of a break, but Jan Stratowski, I don't, uh, this is from National Geographic Poland. How does JET experiments compare to NEF, which is a national ignition facility in the US? And Athena, would you uh, like I could, to take that question. Yes, I can take the question. So the the comparison is a little bit difficult as we are talking about different concepts. So jets working so magnetic uh, confinement fusion, while NIF is inertial confinement fusion. So a one to one comparison is difficult. Um, however, as you also mentioned, um, uh, the NIF has demonstrated net fusion energy gain, which we we cannot do in a device the scale of jet. But as was said before, will be the goal uh, of the next step devices. Um, the point is, and I think Ian said it very clearly, we, we learn from both sides. We learn about the these conditions, we learn how uh, this kind of uh, plasmas work. Uh, so in a sense, no direct comparison, but they're both huge successes for, for fusion energy research and as a whole. Okay, we'll go back to Dennis delbach Um Could Mr. Chapman, so Ian, could you speak, tell us a bit more about this tech project? How will it integrate with the European fusion community and ITER? Okay, so the, the aims of the STEP, um, STEP program are to build a prototype fusion power plant, which produces net energy, so produces net electrical power, um, at the same time as showing that we can self-sustain in fuel, so we breed enough tritium to keep the machine fueled, um, and also demonstrate that it has uh, a method of maintaining the device which scales to the availability that is required in, in commercial power plants that would follow. So those are the three uh, main goals of the project. Um, as I said earlier, we were in a conceptual design phase, which was funded until um, this spring, we are now going into a detailed engineering design phase, which will last for another four years. And then we will start um, some of the long lead uh, assembly items um, moving into the development of the site where we, we have identified a site in the north of England um, and uh, moving into the, the assembly phase over the 2030s. We aim to complete the construction by 2040, uh, which is a very ambitious goal, but that is the aim of the project. As for how it integrates with the wider European fusion community and, and with ITER, look, it is a spherical design. So it has a different topology, um, a different design, which is not being pursued um, by our European partners. But there is huge overlap between that spherical design and conventional um, designs like, like ITER and indeed the, the demo program, which is being pursued by Eurofusion. They both need tritium fueling, they both need robotic maintenance, they both need materials which can withstand very high energy, high, fl high fluence of neutrons. All of those things are challenges that are common to all, all of those machines. And so we work intensely on finding solutions to those challenges, which will support all approaches to fusion. Great, before I continue, um ask uh, pose the next question if the press online if you can continue to put your questions which is state your name and uh the media outlet that you're representing in the q a's we'll continue for them we appreciate we have 25 minutes left um for this press conference so next question elizabeth gibney from nature in the perhaps 15 years between jets shutting down ending its plasma operations and ITER starting fusion with tritium will there be other tokamaks around the world operating with this fuel and then second part to that will JS uh, 60A JTS 60A use tritium and is it likely to break JET's records 
Somebody else could answer that. I'm always talking. <laughs> well, I can take this. Uh, so there are several uh, machines in plan that will work with tritium, but unlike, it's unlikely that it will be the in the coming 15 years. There is a project in the United States where uh, they are aiming at using DT fuel in the coming years. I think that's the only one I'm aware of on yeah. that time scale. That I know of, there are, there are two. So um, Commonwealth Fusion Systems, which is a private company in the US, are currently building a machine called Spark, mm -hmm. which they hope to be operating this decade, which will run with deuterium and tritium fuel. Um, also, the, the Chinese program um, are planning or are actually building a facility called BEST. Um, again, the aim is to operate that before the end of the 2020s, and that will ultimately also operate with uh, deuterium tritium fuel. Um, and then on JT60SA specifically, there is no plan to put tritium into that facility at the moment. Okay, and we can go back up to um, CNN. So this is Angela's balloon. Um, can you put the 69 megajoules in context for us? Um, what does that mean in terms of power? And for clarity, is this a new record break in your previous 159 megajoules? I, I can answer very briefly. So it's in terms of power, it uh, it was a five second stationary discharge. So it was around uh, 12 and a half megawatt um, continuously produced. Uh, if you convert it to electricity uh, one to one, you know, cannot do, but imagine if you can do, you use about one kilowatt per person continuously for normal domestic uh, use. So it can, uh, 12,000 people that can supply with electricity. Of course, you have to run it continuously. You have to produce electricity out of it, which is still a long story. Um, um, not quite sure I understand the second question. Uh, it is breaking the previous record, 59. Yes, it is. Any other panel members want to add to that? So um, we have Talib Josh from BBC News. For several decades of research, viable fusion has always been 20 to 30 years away. Seems like it still is. What assurance do you have to taxpayers that fusion really is viable rather than an endless research program? And, um, but, uh, it looks like Athena, you, know, you would like I to take your opinion, yeah. and the other panel members can certainly say theirs. Uh, yes, I mean, do we have guarantees? I don't think anything in the world has a guarantee, but we are very confident that this is the way to go. This is not an endless research program by far. We're showing major successes one after the other, um, and this does not represent itself only um, in uh, record fusion energy, but also in the in-depth understanding of physics, hiding behind the technological improvements, a way how, how we proceed to, to go about this. Uh, yeah, to me, fusion is, is the reality. It's becoming more and more viable and more and more close, uh, let's say. But yes, it is a long-term project. It is something that takes time. It is complex enough. And uh, But on the other hand, if my personal opinion is we have no other way, uh, we have to eventually have fusion energy as we will need it as mankind, let's say. Uh, so this is uh, a, a goal worth pursuing. We, we we have to do this. And if if I may add, an important aspect of making progress is to build new machines. And we are doing that. This is happening right now. Okay. Any... Oh, I, can, I can add maybe a testament to this is the investments that are coming from the private sector. Uh, uh, which are which amount now to order of the billion euros or billion pounds. Um, so that means people are believing in it. Uh, so it's not just that uh, we are having fun on a research program uh, per se. And also it's important to say that as many successful research programs, uh, the fusion um, efforts also bring uh, a lot of uh, uh, benefits to society in addition to moving us closer to the power plant. So there's a lot of science that's been learn as a lot of technological developments that are used elsewhere. I can mention magnets, uh, for example, for medical application. I can mention materials for uh, aeronautical applications or, or different kinds of application. Uh, robotics, as we already mentioned, is something that's very unique uh, 
in a, in a way it's advanced infusion and so on and so forth. So it's a research program that has at the same time scientific content, uh, fringe benefits and, and uh, technology transfer, and of course, focus on the power plant that will ultimately come. Spill over to Ian, did you, did you want to add something? Okay, it's all covered. Right. Um, Joe Pinkston from the Daily Telegraph again. How much energy was inputted for the 69 megajoules output? And when can we hope to see net gain for the first time? The question was already answered. Uh, maybe it wasn't very clear. So we put about three times more energy uh, as a heating power into the plasma when we get this output of fusion power. So this is not a net gain. Um, as to when we hope to see the net gain, hopefully in ITER, which is what it's designed for, uh, unless some of the private fusion companies will be more successful and quicker. Okay, and now we go to a question um, about the petition from uh, last year. So this is by Sophie de Ville, de Ville uh, La Libre Belgique. A thousand scientists have written a petition uh, or signed a petition that asks to extend JET beyond 2023. Is UKAEA and or Euratom Eurofusion considering to continue to finance JET? Are they both willing to discuss a solution to keep this scientific project running? Yeah, I can have a go at that. Um, so JET is very much big science, okay? It's it's big science. And when you when you work in big science, you have to plan on decadal timeframes. So we as a community did have a, a lot of thought and conversation and planning around a series of enhancements and upgrades to JET in around 2016. So that was the time that we would have had to embark on a, on a series of upgrades. Um, so we have upgraded JET many, many times over the years. It, when it was initially built, it was meant to close operation in 1992. Um, and then it got extended to 1997. And then it got extended to 2000. And it just has been extended and extended. But each time, there has always been a plan for enhancements and upgrades to the machine, which will have um, enabled new science, enabled you to, to undertake new science. So we did consider upgrades to the machine back in 2016 and that was the time that we would have needed to make decisions about an extension to jet and the whole community came to the conclusion that it was right instead of upgrading jet to focus our effort and our energy on preparing for ITER. at that point we were going to transition from jet operation into ITER. Um, now that we're in 2023 we're seven years too late to start making enhancements and upgrades to the machine because that's how long it takes it takes multiple years to upgrade a facility on the scale that JET is, and, and by the way, also costs hundreds of millions of euros. And so the decision had been taken many years ago, and we have been planning for that decision as a community, right? Planning for that decision for many years now. Um, and we have now transitioned into a, a decommissioning and repurposing program for JET, as, as Joel described. So um, this has always been our plan. Nothing has changed, really. The plan is extant. Um, and we now prepare for ITER operations and other important facilities and programs which are happening in Fusion Programme globally in the UK and Europe. Okay, if there are no more questions, feel free to, um, online media, please feel free to continue putting in your questions. If not, then I'll pose a question um, myself. Um, in terms of um, breaking the new record just before decommissioning, how is this, how is Jet able to do that? Was it a case of there being less risk so they could just push the boundaries and go for it? Joelle. Uh, so actually for DT3, no, we, we were not taking risks, but uh, the uh, technical team invested a lot of time to make sure that all systems would be operating to the maximum uh, performance. Uh, we did push the operational boundaries in the very last jet campaign, which was in pure deuterium, uh, where we investigated uh, very long poles and uh, also unmitigated uh, runaway beam experiments, uh, knowing that these uh, would end up in damage to the first wall. But for DT3, no, we just made sure that the, the machine was working at, at its best. And um, I'll pose a question um, in terms of um, how the scientific community uh, feels now that um, JET has come to its end of 
uh, its plasma operations. How does it, how does the scientific community feel uh, now that it has? That's one of the scientists or you like oh, to we can say a uh, personal uh, opinion. Yes, of course it's it's sad. <laughs> um, yeah, as was said earlier, the, many people are investing a lot of uh, their time and their efforts in this. Uh, and uh, I have to stress, this is a team. This is another thing that Jet has shown. And I think it was uh, possible to answer the question about the legacy of JET is how to work as a team. We're talking about many, many, many people working together on one goal. And of course, um, this doesn't end. We hope that this kind of teams will continue to exist and keep on working. But yes, anything that ends is a little bit sad. But it is um, is a decision that, as was said before, were made quite some time ago. And they are decisions that one uh, understands. There's always a cost and gain uh, choice in there. Uh, but but yes, of course, uh, if the question is about feeling, it's it's always a bit uh, sad. <laughs> Joanne can <laughs> continue. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, and of course, some of the experiments that we were doing uh, in the recent two years, we had not been able to spend much time on. So we, we felt, OK, with a bit more time, we can we can get more results. But uh, um, I think, though, the, the important thing to note is that the JET work does not finish, so the teams remain. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, uh, first to publish the results of the experiments and then to interpret the results and see how they apply to the next uh, step uh, machines. Right. If there are no more questions, I'll leave any final remarks. We'll start with Tim. Any final remarks from Tim and then we'll go to the room. Just again, congratulations to the JET team. And as has been said many times by several of the speakers, the, the support of JET for the ITER project has been enormous over the, the especially this last two years of, of operation. Uh, and I want to thank on behalf of the ITER project, the ITER organization, uh, the JET team, Eurofusion, UKAEA, and the European Commission for, for this support. It's uh, you talked about what happens after Jet's gone. These these are things that we could not get any other way. And so I, I really want to emphasize uh, my personal appreciation, but also on behalf of the project and the organization, uh, my congratulations and appreciation for these achievements and for your work. And to the room, any final um, remarks? Personally, I work at Jet last 15 years continuously. Um, that's that's a long time. It does feel strange, and it finishes, and um, it's very difficult to accept that uh, we all knew it's going to happen. Um, there's still a lot of work. They like said the jet stopped operation, but there's, uh, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of scientific output we still need to understand. And personally, I will be busy with that for another couple of years at least, and many other European scientists will do the same. I just want to say, first of all, I I should also congratulate from all of us. The, the, the ITER team, uh, because it's some, you know, we're not we're not proud enough of the assembly of ITER being almost finished, and I think it's a fantastic achievement to see all of that on site. And uh, also, together with congratulations, I'd like to uh, wish that uh, ITER will become the same kind of a hub for science and technology, but also for human beings that Jet has been and it still is. And I think the transfer from jet to ITER will be occurring naturally in the next uh, in the next years. And uh, if it does become this kind of hub um, for for individuals, I think it will also already succeed um, on that point of view. I, th I think this is really the way forward. The community that has built been built around around Europe and the world, also thanks to jet, will now uh, be focusing on ITER, and that would be really a success worldwide. Ethina and then Ian. Uh, yes, I think the as a simple word is um, a very big thank you to both the experimental teams and operational staff that made all of this possible. I think be, uh, beyond the record that we've discussed quite a bit today, we've achieved tremendous results. Um, the dedication of so many people all together is to me always impressive and how much they want to work hard for this and make this a success. And this is also what makes me believe that we can do this <laughs> in the long run. Um, so yes, just a, a big thank you to to everybody that contributed to this in, in one way or another. Yes. I guess I can close by essentially echoing those remarks. I think this is a really fitting ending for 40 years of operation 
what has been the the, the biggest and best fusion facility in the world. Um, the, the legacy of that is a team. It's a team which solves problems. I mean, I, I lost count of the number of scientific and engineering challenges we've had to overcome in order to get to these results. Um, and my assurance to Palab, who asked the question about how do you assure that we will get to fusion, is um, by seeing the ingenuity and the brilliance of those people, as I do every day. I'm very lucky to, to work with such brilliant people who overcome these in, enormous challenges. And that is how I can assure you that we will get there in the end, is because of the brilliant people who altruistically try to make fusion happen. Right, on that note, um, I think I thank you all for attending. Thank you very much for being interested in what we had to tell you. Um, if you need anything further, then um, please get in touch with Celestine and the media team who will be able to provide you any other collateral that you might need or any further information that you need for, for your reports. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.